Welcome to this online lesson on causes of illness and disease in the 20th century. Yes, that's right, our medicine through time studies have now brought us right up to the 20th century. We should now see the progress of medicine accelerating somewhat, especially given the breakthroughs of the 19th century. But specifically, in this lesson, our aims are to identify lifestyle and genetic factors in causing illness and disease to explain the role of lifestyle and genetic factors in causing illness and disease, and to evaluate the impact of lifestyle and genetic factors in the development of, of medicine. Yes, there is a common thread running through here. So without further ado, unless you're going to write down this title and the aims, we'll move on to our first section. To illustrate this progress, we're going to have a look at life expectancy and what it might tell us about the health of people across the 20th century. Consider the average age at death in 1900, another way of expressing life expectancy. On average, men lived to the age of 46 and women 50. This would be skewed somewhat by the number of children who died in infancy at this time. By 1930, the trend is slightly reversed. This doesn't happen often in history, but it may be explained by a difference for women at this time in that childbirth was still quite dangerous and yet other aspects of health had improved. By 1950, the trend reverses to where we expect before. Men on average died at age 66 and women 71. By the year 2000, men lived until the age of 75 on average and women had a life expectancy of 80. That's increased even more in the last 20 years up to the present day. So what might explain this? Well, first of all, let's have a look at the difference. By how many years did life expectancy increase in the 20th century for both men and women? Then secondly, improvements in which area, area or areas of medicine might explain why women now live longer than men. I've given you a bit of a hint on that one there. Pause the video while you complete those first two tasks. All right, let's go through some answers. So to calculate the improvement in life expectancy for men, you take the larger figure in the year 2000, that's 75, and you subtract the smaller figure, that's in 1900, 46. What does that give you? Well, it should give you 29. But what about for women? Well, here we'd need to find the difference between 80 and 50, and you'll find that that is 30. So the average increase is slightly more for women, but not by much. Now, we mentioned before that women's life expectancy was improved by drastic improvements in the uh, safety of childbirth, for example, with hospital births becoming even more common and even safer as the 20th century advanced. Men, of course, would not see quite so much change in this respect, although it should be recognised that the 20th century saw an unusually high proportion of men at various points killed. Yes, that's right, the world wars. Though, of course, that doesn't have a bearing on current statistics. Thirdly, then, place these factors for improving health in order of importance for increasing life expectancy. Diet, lifestyle, treatment of disease, prevention of infection, and improved public health and hospitals. Pause the video while you complete this third part. Done? Well, all of them are important, but whatever order you've put them in, you'll want to review that as we go through this, and perhaps you'll change your mind about some, or perhaps your uh, thoughts will be confirmed by the information you're about to get. Nevertheless, let's move on. Lifestyle factors. During the 20th century, many more causes for illness and disease were identified. This is a process that very much started in the Victorian period of the 19th century. So these are considered the main modern causes of early death. Smoking, drinking alcohol, a lack of exercise, being overweight, poor diet, poverty and stress. Yes, if you're preparing for your exams, don't get too stressed. Apparently it's bad for your health. Uh, and yet telling you that's probably stressed you out even more. Sorry. So these lifestyle factors all play a significant role in the health and potential illnesses that a person might suffer. Some tasks then. Firstly, copy down the mind map of lifestyle factors. You could add basic illustrations to make it more memorable. That certainly helps me. Secondly, explain how each factor could affect your health. And then thirdly, how could identifying how these lifestyle factors affect health actually increase life expectancy? Pause the video here while you complete those tasks. So hopefully you got your mind map down, that in itself is quite useful. So how could each factor affect your health? Well, many of these things are now understood to be harmful to us. 
For example, smoking. Smoking is known to cause cancer and conditions of the lungs and various other things. Drinking alcohol similarly can damage the liver and also increase blood pressure and other things. A lack of exercise just means that you're going to be less healthy and fit in the first place and it can affect the health of your heart, as can being overweight. Poor diet might have a couple of different things here. It might mean that you are eating too many calories or the wrong sorts of uh, foods and nutrition, which can contribute to being overweight and other um, potential problems. But also it could mean that you're not getting the right nutrients. So a lack of good vitamins and minerals. Poverty as well. Poor diet is often affected by poverty. If you can't afford quality foods or varied foods, that affects your quality of life. And stress. This is a reasonably modern phenomenon. After all, our stress impulses are based upon well-developed and evolved instincts to try and keep us safe. However, our brains are not yet evolved to cope with uh, the, the modern working practices and other things that happen in our lives. And so our stress responses are less helpful than they would be when we were, shall we say, cavemen and cave women hunting and gathering out in the open. So stress shouldn't be uh, ignored. It can, again, raise blood pressure and cause heart problems and other things. So how could identifying how these lifestyle factors affect health actually increase life expectancy? Well, quite simply, it means that by identifying the problems, finding out how it affects us, we can then try and find solutions to prevent. Here's a crucial one, genetics. Something that was developed in the 20th century in terms of our understanding and is still being developed to this day. Inside each cell of your body, there are several identical strings of DNA. This stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, but you don't need to know that. DNA is essentially a long list of instructions that operates every cell of your body. There are over 3,000 million letters of code in your body. This is known as the human genome. These instructions are grouped together in genes, each with a different function. For example, eye colour, height, if you have a disability or disease, might also be determined by your DNA. The study of DNA and how we inherit characteristics is known as genetics. So, how does understanding genetics and DNA help medicine develop? First off, you might want to make some notes on what DNA is and its effects, and then we'll have a look at some case studies of how it applies to medicine. Pause the video if you're going to make some notes now. Let's have a look at some background. The story. Two men walked into the Eagle pub in Cambridge. One of them announces, we have found the secret of life. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it wasn't. The year was 1953, the place was Cambridge in the United Kingdom, and the people were James D. Watson, who was American, and Francis Crick, who was British. Their discovery was the structure of DNA, specifically the double helix that we demonstrated before. Although it should be remembered that they weren't actually the first to get there. Someone had got there before them. Rosalind Franklin had demonstrated a double helix structure in 1952 through this X-ray diffusion photograph that I've put on the screen here. Sadly, though, she died in 1958. The Nobel Prize was awarded to the men. The amount to which they recognised her contribution is open to a bit of question. This was a more sexist time, sadly, and Nobel Prizes weren't awarded to people after they had died. But we can take a moment to remember Rosalind Franklin now. We're now going to watch a video about the discovery of DNA. I'm indebted to whoever made this, although I've not been able to find the credit. If it's you, then please let me know. I'll happily put a credit in the credits. So don't worry too much about the science behind this. You don't need to know the chemical structure behind DNA, for example. But the key aspects that you will need to focus on are as follows. The key individuals involved, the key technology involved, how important was the discovery of DNA, and with that in mind, make notes under those three points while or just after watching the video. You as late as 1951, the chemical structure of DNA remained a tantalizing enigma. At Cambridge University in England, biologist James Watson and physicist Francis Crick had been working to unlock the secrets of the DNA molecule. But they weren't alone. Several other groups of competing scientists were hard at work trying to solve the same puzzle. Some important facts about DNA were already known. For instance, scientists knew that DNA was composed of four bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. They also had been able to infer something about its structure with the help of X-ray crystallography. 
This technique involved passing an X-ray beam through a crystallized DNA molecule and capturing a vague, shadowy image of its internal structure on a photographic plate. Armed with this information, along with their own knowledge of chemical structure, Watson and Crick began building a three-dimensional model of DNA. I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small molecule, and uh, somehow you had to, to form link bonds. Here's uh, A, and here's T, and uh, I wanted this hydrogen to point directly at this nitrogen. So I had something like this. Ooh. So then I went to the, the pair and wanted this nitrogen to point to this one. And I went like this. Whoa. Today, you can buy a kit and assemble the structure that Watson and Crick put together but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Watson and Crick needed more data. With the help of physicist Maurice Wilkins, they gained access to an X-ray picture of a DNA molecule that had been taken by his research partner. Her name was Rosalind Franklin. Without her knowledge, Watson and Crick used the data from that X-ray image and successfully completed their model. In a 1953 issue of Nature magazine, Watson and Crick revealed their amazing discovery to the world. Their model showed that the DNA molecule was a double helix. The twin strands were composed of pairs of the four known bases linked together by hydrogen bonds. And the whole structure corkscrew like a spiral ladder, which could easily pull apart in order to make copies of itself with the same encoded genetic information. Watson and Crick had won the race. The discovery of the structure of DNA sparked a scientific revolution. It illuminated the molecular and biochemical foundation of life in a whole new way. It opened doors for areas of research and other great discoveries that few ever imagined possible. As for Watson and Crick, their discovery of the double helix, along with Maurice Wilkins, won them a share of the 1962 Nobel Prize. And what of Wilkins' colleague, Rosalind Franklin? Despite her contribution to the discovery, she wasn't considered for the 62 prize. The rules state that it can only be awarded to a living recipient. Rosalind Franklin died in 1958 of ovarian cancer, most likely caused by exposure to x-rays. So what's the use? It can be used to treat hereditary or inherited diseases. It can be used to help us understand why people become ill and to try and find solutions to this. Every living thing, including bacteria, has DNA. Understanding DNA tells us how all life works. Genetic engineering of DNA can fix faults in a person, person's DNA. For example, it may be possible to engineer a diabetic person's genes to produce insulin or to control body sugars, although we've not managed this yet. Special treatments can be produced that only target and kill specific types of cell in the body, such as cancer cells. Information about DNA can help scientists grow new and replacement organs that may in the future provide replacements for things like failed kidneys and hearts. Here's one of the more controversial experiments though. Using DNA cells to, in order to grow an ear on a mouse. It looks like a human ear, doesn't it? Well, actually, these cells have just been sort of put over a mesh that's in the shape of a human ear to show how body parts might be grown using genetic engineering. Obviously, there are moral issues surrounding this, and you'll have your own opinions on that. It's worth pointing out, for example, though, that the recent coronavirus vaccines, or at least some of them, are the results of the understanding of DNA, specifically the DNA of the virus, and how we can train our bodies to fight it. So a lot of this stuff is in the early stages of development, and we're just on the cusp of understanding how useful it's going to be in the future. 
Let's apply this info then. Answer the following exam style question using at least three examples from this section. You can make notes of them as well. Explain how DNA and genetic medical knowledge are used in modern medicine. You'll want three well-explained examples and a brief conclusion in order to get all 12 marks. In other videos, I give much more feedback on how to complete these exam style questions, so you can either view those to get a better understanding of how they're answered, or if you're feeling confident, you can have a go at that now. If not, we will move on. But if you are going to do it, give yourself no more than about 20 minutes to write down your answer. Controversies. Here's one view. I should point out that this is just something that I've written up to sum up some of the views rather than a real quote. Some people believe that genetic engineering is wrong, but I don't agree. Proper scientists and doctors will use it to help people with diseases that we've never been able to cure before. At the moment, there are still illnesses that can't be cured, but imagine if we could use our knowledge of DNA to provide cures for things like diabetes. Also, we may one day be able to grow replacement organs from scratch without any of the problems donated our organs have. Therefore, genetic medicine is a good thing. But here's an alternative view. Again, I've just sort of made this up, and it's not some, a real quote by somebody, but it does sum up one of the, some of the genuine views surrounding this. I am very worried about gene therapies. In the past, the church has been accused of holding back medical progress. That may be the case, but this is different. As a priest, I believe that only God can decide whether a person lives or dies. He creates all life. We should not be able to create living cells from scratch. That's not natural. And there are a lot of non-religious people who would think that it is morally wrong too. I'm sure doctors would use the knowledge of DNA to help people, but not everyone can be trusted to do the right thing. Just look at what the Nazis tried to do to the disabled. After all, they killed them. Genetic engineering is morally wrong. It is a bad thing. Okay, I've given two very much opposed and extreme views here, but it's to helping to dem demonstrate the controversies surrounding the use of genetic engineering. This is something that you might have investigated in sort of RE lessons or maybe worldviews lessons, whatever you're used to doing. So, if you're wanting to engage with this, or you could skip it if you prefer, summarise each argument in a few sentences. Get the main points down, that means. Explain which argument you agree with most, and now do the same, but pretending you have reversed your point of view. This helps you to really test your point of view on whether you've argued it well or not. If you haven't argued it very well because you've just changed your mind, think about what convinced you. OK, if you're going to do those tasks, pause the video here. If not, we'll move on to something else. Finally then. Let's consider medieval and renaissance medicine, particularly the causes of disease and illness. The main beliefs, beliefs in medieval and renaissance medicine were that the causes of disease and illness were sent by God, bad air, and by having the humours out of balance. So how does this feed into the treatment of disease and illness and the prevention of disease and illness if that is what is understood to be the cause? Compare that to modern medicine. The causes of disease and illness are understood to be bacteria, genetic problems and people's lifestyles. So how does that feed into the treatment of disease and illness? And how, also, how does that feed into the prevention of Ill disease and illness? So identify the differences between the understanding of the causes of illness between these two time periods. Secondly, explain why the understanding of the cause of illness are different between the two time periods. And then explain how identifying the causes of disease and illness in modern medicine has impacted on prevention and treatment. To help you contextualise this, it might be worth you remembering exactly how they tried to treat and prevent disease in earlier times when, let's face it, they had the wrong ideas about what caused disease and illness. Pause the video while you complete these final tasks. So first of all, we can see that many superstitious and religious ideas have now been dropped. Although bad air and the humours are at least semi-scientific, they were incorrect. Germ theory has now been basically proven. We also understand viruses. We understand genetic problems, although we don't always have the ability to overcome them. And we understand the impact of lifestyle on people's health. So why has the cause of illness uh, changed? Well, for one thing, we've got all of the discoveries that have come since the Renaissance. Pasteur's germ theory being one, Watson and Crick, and let's not forget Franklin's discovery of the structure of DNA and how genetics work. And we now understand because people are living longer, how lifestyle has an impact on this. So what effect does that have on prevention and treatment? 
Well, for prevention, hopefully we understand that certain lifestyles are unhealthy. If we avoid them, then with a bit of luck, we can live longer. What about the treatment of disease then? Well, we are developing new treatments all the time. But things like antibiotic medicines that are common today were only just being developed in the 20th century. But that's for a future lesson. However, that's the end of this lesson. I hope that you found it useful. And if you have, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. I'll be back with more Medicine Through Time content very soon. Thanks for watching.